Gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to this uh, session and to this side event for uh, the Smart City World Expo. Uh, this session is organized uh, by Eurocities, the major uh, or the association of the major European cities, together with the working group housing of Eurocities. Um, my name is Herbert Bartik, I'm from Vienna, and my company is called Urban Innovation Vienna, and we are advising public bodies on issues related to smart city, on issues related to urban development, and on social housing. Um, today's topic is, is a very broad one. So we, we, we're talking about smart housing in a smart city, and we want to discuss the changing landscape of housing governance and different municipal responses. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that we have uh, representatives from different cities who will share their experiences, who will share their ideas and projects and approaches towards that changing landscape, which is really a complex issue to address. Um, before going into more details in terms of content and our agenda, I would like to give the words for, uh, to uh, Susanne Bauer and Agathe Krause. Susanne Bauer is from Vienna. She is the chair of the working group housing. And Agatha Krause is a policy advisor uh, from Eurocities. And they will kind of give us the guiding words and set the stage for the following discussions. Susanne. Thank you, Herbert. Um, hello and welcome, also from on my behalf, to our session, Changing Landscape of Housing Governance, Municipal Responses. Please let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Susanne Bauer, and I am the chair of the Eurocities Working Group Housing, and originally I do come from Jena. Talking about an affordable rental market, many cities are facing a challenge. Because one of the findings of the new the State of the Housing in the EU 2017 report is that housing has become the highest expenditure for Europeans and overburden rate remains stable at high level and hitting disproportionately harder the poor. That's the situation in Europe in 2017. Actually, we as cities don't mind at all if people, for example, rent a room to tourists for some days and pay the respective taxes to the municipality. However, it gets tricky when housing units are misused, in inverted commas, permanently for rent to tourists only. Actually, this might add further pressure on the rental market. On the other side, tourism is an important economic factor and actually cities need all the taxes and fees which it does not receive automatically. Another tendency we are observing is that there are more and more limited temporary rental contracts. That means when after, for example, three or five years, the tenant has to apply for the prolongation of the contract, he or she might be confronted with a rent increase. So in the end, limited temporary rental contracts are a factor which increases the general rental level on the market. This is not helpful at all in times where the supply side is not providing enough affordable housing. <coughs> so ladies and gentlemen, we are looking forward how cities are facing the challenge. We are here to learn from one another experience and I'm looking forward to this exchange. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Agatha Kraus and I'm policy advisor on housing for the Eurocities. Eurocities is one of co-organizers of this event alongside the Expo, the Congress and the City of Barcelona and we are very, very pleased to be here. Today's meeting is dedicated to, as it was mentioned, changing landscape of housing governance. It is the second day of our event that during the 
that is broadly titled Smart Housing in a Smart City. First day focused on rent ceilings and rent control measures in cities. So we are following the pathway of reasoning about how cities can embrace dynamics, some of the positive, some of the negative ones that are associated with housing markets in Europe. We have very prominent speakers today. We have the deputy mayor of Barcelona, Ms. Laia Ortiz, speaking as the first one. Then we have deputy mayor of Paris, me and Mr. Ian Brossat, spe speaking as the second one. Then we will have um, representatives from the cities of Amsterdam, city of Barcelona, and the city of Vienna, providing also some in-depth in input into the discussion about how to manage new ways or new modes of providing housing in cities. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Laia Ortiz, Deputy Mayor of Barcelona, to kick off the meeting. Thank you. Good morning. And in the first place, thank you very much to all the people organizing this, this event. For me, it's a, a real pleasure to have the chance to participate in Eurocities event in my, in my city. It's the first time that I, I think I can, I can do it. And in fact, participating at home, because the city, in fact, is, is our home. Yet nowadays, uh, it is also where the right to at home, one of the most basic but least protected rights, is most threatened. Think, I think that it's a very uh, provocative idea also to talk about the right to housing in a smart city con congress that many times we are talking about the future or 30, uh, 30 years to can see what the cities are going to be, but we are not solving the really very, very crucial problems like the right to, to housing. The right to housing is one of the main priorities of our government, since we arrived to the government, uh, to the City Council of Barcelona two, two years uh, ago. And it is also one of the main challenges we have to face. Just uh, last, last week, we present the, the, last, the last polls of the city and which, uh, about the services and evaluation no? to participate uh, thousands of people in Barcelona, and the right and the access to housing is the second biggest problem for the citizenship in, the, in, the, in Barcelona. There are many reasons to be seriously worried about the issue, and it is one of the main causes, if not the most important, for social exclusion and urban poverty in many cities today. So I'm talking also as a chair of the Social Affairs Forum. I'm, I is, today is the, the biggest link of poverty and social exclusion to not having the right to, to, to housing. I want to start to talk about our city, which is the, the, the situation in, in Barcelona. I not go through detail of all the, the data, but just to show which is the situation of the residents, rental stock, rental contracts, Airbnb apartments in Barcelona that we also have to talk about, uh, about that. Social and affordable rental stock, only 1.5% in Barcelona. So it's, it's really uh, an explosive combination of the all difficulties that, that, that we have. Um, with, with all this data, we identified uh, when we started to make the, the, the big plan of right to housing in Barcelona, we uh, tried to, to identify the, the five main problems that we have to face. Of course, first of all, emergency situation. Uh, in the, um, uh, before I, would, I, I was talking about, about the data, one of the, the I don't know, the, the impacting and shocking data is that 3,000 uh, more or less evictions every year in Barcelona. 3,000 evictions. It means that today, today, only today, there are like 20 evictions and 90% are for rental people that are exclu excluded from, from her, their, their houses. So emergency situation, 
Of course, gentrification, speculation, tourism, and increase of the prices, all this mobility of the people, who is expelled from the, the, the city and who is coming to, to the city, and this, and this changing, demographic changing. Also, the lack of public housing stock. We are, no, from the, the, the cities in Europe with the, with the um, with a with a stock of of public stock more more reduced uh, stock and it's a really difficult also a fourth problem or at least something that we have to face is the change and the aging of population it's not only how much how many housings that we have you know how are they if we are all houses uh, without elevators with and uh, no not accessibility we have to talk about and to to plan to change it, and also we have a five problem. Also, after the this this economical crisis, especially in the south of of Europe, the vacant and underutilized housing. We have housing that are empty, although we have all these all these problems. So, with all these five uh, identified uh, big problems in in Barcelona, we we have to to plan, no, how to how to face this. About the emergency situations, I was talking before. There is a worrying recovery of the rental prices. This is really, really a, a worrying problem. Of course, it goes with the economy, but in, in Barcelona, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to face because even after seven, eight years of, of economic crisis, now the prices in Barcelona are increasing um, month after month, like in one year, like 20% uh, um, increasing the, the prices. So here you have the data of the petitions of, of evictions. And also the problem is um, the state law of rental that is against uh, any kind of stability. We only have contracts uh, last uh, three years, three years contract. So it makes that this uh, changing a lot and to negotiate the rentals make it also mo to push the prices also um, also up. And annually, the 70% of the evictions in all the, in all Spain are in Barcelona. So it, it's of course the, the biggest the biggest problem. The second thing, the gentrification, speculation, and tourists. We have to talk about that, especially in a also in a in a city with important important international congress as it is uh, a smart city but the the combination of a reducing profitability of the capital the lack of the controls and strict ease of international financial movements have turned urban housing especially in dynamic cities such as such barcelona into an object of specula speculative investment but also Spain has a tradition about that. It's a long time doing like that, but now this combination is, is making it uh, even more, 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 more difficult. This dynamic is subjecting our cities to a great pressure, often, often by forces of international scope. Um, likewise, other city, our cities, very success, has put long-term residents and families at risk. And touristic pressure boosts the increase of prices, not only just the investment for speculation, but also we have the tourist pressure that make these prices also up. We now have neighborhoods in our city in which there is more tourist accommodation than primary residence fl flats. This is, a, this is a, a reality. In the city center, we have this, this kind of, 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 of reality. The purchasing of complete buildings by investment funds with the aim of destinating them to tourist promotion and the local infestation of global short-term rentals, corporations such as Airbnb, is also a shared problem between many today. And in Barcelona, it's really important. We have seen the numbers in Barcelona. In September 2016, we had 23,000 Airbnb apartments, only 9,000 were legal. So we we have to find, this is a really energy, we find where are they to <laughs> persecute the, the people that are making the legal and they don't pay anything, but they just expelling our our our, our people uh, out from the neighborhoods. 
And we also have to talk, uh, apart from this, uh, the process of gentrification also drives up housing prices, displaces lower income. So we have a really sometimes uh, difficulties when we have to decide because we have to to make new urbanism in 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 some poor areas for example we have to make uh, green uh, green zones for example but every time that you make that you know that the neighbors that have paid this restructuration maybe will be expelled from from that neighborhood so how we need we need new tools just to of course to to to, to face the gentrification pro, pro, process. The increase in the housing prices, especially of rents, is becoming unaffordable for the majority. It's not just for the poor or the, or the down classes, it's just for the majority of the people that live in the, in the city. And together with low wages, especially in the south of Europe, precarious labor contracts and the widening income inequality make up a trap of vulnerability, which is increasingly taken in broader social sectors. So, it's therefore unsurprising that various forms of residential exclusions are being increased. Families displaced to the urban periphery, even more critical housing conditions, smaller, more vulnerable, many people in a very small housing, and the most extreme expression of housing instability, like homelessness. Today we have the 16% the 16 of the people that are on the street, homeless, they, they have a labor contract, they, are, they have a job. And that this is a really a big difference since eight, eight, years, eight years ago. But this is not only a, a South situation or, um, or a situation of Barcelona. And as a, a social affairs forum, I think that we have to know what is happening in the last times in the biggest in the in the in the cities and Europe. What is happening with the homelessness? Even the cities that were leading the right to housing, even those cities have problems. For example, look at Austria, Belgium, Germany, that have a really uh, uh, at least more tools just to protect the right to housing. This is the situation that we that we find. Um, in Barcelona, of course, we, we evolve like all the, all the rest of, the, of the, uh, Europe in this situation. And, and now we firmly believe that homelessness is a phenomenon that needs an approach from housing policies. It's not something that is different and has nothing to do. We don't have to say, okay, poverty and homelessness, and then the, uh, the rest of the, of the housing policies. I think that we have to talk this is together because it's the, the same phase of the of the housing exclusion. In Barcelona, we can say that the 80% of the poverty and exclusion in the city is related to housing. So I think that now it's it's the big the big um, uh, challenge of of all the the European the, the European cities. Just we we have a, a calculated this something that I, I, I think it's really shocking and we make from the social rights area. To cover the basic needs for the population in Barcelona under the, the threshold of poverty will cost 117 million of euro. But to cover the basic needs and the housing for the population in Barcelona under this situation of poverty will cost 574 million. Like we have to multiply per four, just if we include uh, housing. So this is the, the, the origin of the majority of the problems of the, of the exclu social, social exclusion. So um, now we are talking about the, also the housing stock. Barcelona started working on housing policies 100 years ago but it was really not very productive. We only have 1.5% of housing, of social housing in the city. So I think it's the biggest failure of this city. I mean, after 100 years uh, doing a, 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 a talking about a housing policies, we only have this, this stock. And the threat that we, that we face in order to change the, the housing policy tradition of Barcelona is one of the biggest in Europe. To be able 
to fight the market's hegemony and the residential exclusion is even more difficult on these circumstances that we have so, 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 less, uh, so less stock. Right now, we, have, we are facing an emergency context, but, and we do it without a minimum, a minimum of social, social stock housing. But at the same time, we want to achieve the transformation of the mid-term and long-term housing policies to change the model, the model that brought us here. And I, I think it's the, the, main, the main reason that we, why we are here and why we make this, this plan. Also, we have to talk, uh, as I said, aging population, which is the, the situation and which will be the situation in 10, in 10 years uh, all, and uh, in 10 years in the future. Um, and, and also, we have to, to talk which will be the needs in, in two, 2040. In Barcelona, the generation that today is over 60 years old commonly owns their homes because it was the generation that bought the, the, the house and they will have this stability at least uh, when, when they, they, they become elderly. But um, the number of house, houses without only one person living in and with two or three empty rooms is increasing because this generation, the children, leaves home and now we have big houses with only one or two people uh, inside. But will be the, 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 the lucky generation that bought the house, but the increasing people, they don't have the, the, this, this right and they cannot afford at all. So we can say uh, that aging of population is pushing families and young people out of the city. This is a, 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 a situation. But also, that it's also a worrying that we made a mat that the people that have some kind of dependency, no, in Barcelona, where are the, the or mobile um, disabled or related to, to aging, and we know that there are 4,000 people with some kind of dependency or limited mobility living in buildings with no elevator. So they are a, a prisoners in their house because their house is not a prepared to that, to that situation. So also, the emergency to sh situation we are facing doesn't allow us to have empty or under, underutilized uh, houses. The first step was to know exactly how big this was, this problem, because there were a lot of data, one saying that there was 80,000 uh, back and housing, another, another study say 3,000. So now, now we are trying to find them and to know who, who are the owners and how to mobilize this empty, empty housing. But of course, after saying all this situation and, this, and, and, and all the, the tradition that have Barcelona with the housing, I think that we have to talk that we need a change of mentality in all the areas when we talk about, about housing. In Barcelona, when it comes to right to housing, we understand that a change of mentality, I said, is, is needed. A big change of the way we perceive the right. It's not a speculation right. It's a right to live in a, in a house that we have also to change to mold this, m many citizenship that things that they have to right to speculate and to expect the value increase. We also we have to understand the right to housing as the right to a public education or the right to a public health system. And if we don't understand, and all the people also understand that, it would be really, really dif difficult to, to change the, the situation. So we, we made this right to housing plan 2016-2025. And after analyzing the context and the specificity of the city, housing stock, we designed a new strategy as a long-term tool. We know that we cannot solve the problems only in four years, even only in, in eight years. It's really a huge uh, difficulty. But we made this, this strategy saying, OK, we have to prevent and address housing emergency and residential exclusion. We have to guarantee the good of use of housing, a good use of that. We have to increase the public and affordable housing stock, and we have to maintain and rehabilitate and improve the current stock. We have also a, a, a very, very, very old stock, like 50 years ago or, or, or more. So what have we, we made? 
uh, first of all, we, we create um, also a aid for rent allowances. It's not really sustainable to keep on like with the prices that are increasingly in two, in two years, but we need to put the, remain the families in their in their homes, so the aid has increased a lot. Also, we create a unit against residential exclusion. It's a unit just to help people to make a mediation negotiation also with the owner and also to negotiate the the, the rental the rental contracts and also to stop eviction and fight directly against resident, residential exclusion. We also uh, need to underline and reinforce the social function of, of housing with regulation. Of course, in, from the city, it's not like Berlin or Vienna that have more right, or even Paris that have more right to regulate. We don't have this, this, the, this competence from the local government, but we try to do our best with all urbanist uh, instrument and with regional laws just to apply it in, in, in Barcelona just to mobilize the empty stock. Of course, if you have a long-term empty house, uh, you are not allowed to do that. So we have, of course, to, um, to, to, find, to find it. So, um, and also, of course, one of the mid-term uh, uh, aims is to expand affordable stock. We increase the investment on housing. We, we um, um, triplet uh, the, investi the investment in housing, moving from 45 million to 160 million just in, in, in housing policies in Barcelona. And, but in a sharp contrast that what is doing the state and the regional investment that have decreased the investment on housing policies, the 70% in, in the last years. So we are really alone doing that, and it's <laughs> quite quite difficult. So we want to expand affordable stock, uh, giving a new impulse also to social and affordable housing. How to do it? <clears throat> we we want to do it in a in a mix, but we need in the first in the first place an up down strategy we need a new a new tools and we want to create a metropolitan housing company to manage affordable rental stock i know that it is a very i don't know even old fashioned <laughs> things in in europe because they, there are cities and countries that have like uh, nearly a century doing that but here in spain it would be really a new <laughs> phenomenon if we can manage to have uh, to have this this metropolitan housing company to make this social housing just affordable housing no that what is have been doing in italy in, Berlin, in nordic in nordic countries we also have bottom-up strategy. It means promote, promoting of new ways to access to affordable housing, for ex more communitarian. We don't only just want to build, but we want to make it sustainable. We, uh, we need a mix of different needs of, of housing and services, how to design a city that are really also more healthy and a communitarian uh, model of building of building it and it means co-housing okay co-housing co-housing uh, keys um, one of the of the spirits and just to to go into the end of the of the of this plan is citizen empowerment if we need a cultural change not just a policy or investment if we need a cultural change we also have to empower the people about the right the right to the, the housing of course we also have a, um, a line about invest in rehabilitation no? to adapt the housing that we already have just to the needs of the of the of the people and not just I will move on to the to the end but what we, we what um, the political the political perspective to face all these problems and this and to and to make these plans we need of course in a european level one thing that it's really important we need networking and we need more municipalism cities are where the problem is and also where most of the solutions are appearing this is also reflected in the state of housing in the eu that was presented uh, recently 
the report that Housing Europe presented last month in the European Parliament, they say we find local authorities cities coming up with a solution rather than national policies. So if this is the situation and the reality is our, in our cities, why don't we have enough tools, enough investment, enough fin financial resources just to face the problems? Because when even we are in a different colors in political uh, uh, we are really agree and we need the same the, the, the same tools in, in from the local governments. And one thing that we have to say in this Congress, but also at the European institutions, we need support from European funds. We need European funds. We need a regulation and directive that protect the right to housing. We have no protection at the European level. Um, a, a, with a little bit of coherence on what is happening in, in our cities. And we need that they don't put, just not go with us uh, accompanying, but they don't put uh, barriers on all the policies that in a local level we are doing. So we need funds from Europe, and we also need help in regulation this as a right uh, and the same level in, in, other, in other services. So we also, of course, need to regulate the, the tourism in our city. I want, to, I, I want to say that this kind of coherence from economic and the social, and, and the, and the social policies in Europe has been working from Eurocity networking. For example, Vienna is leading the, the, economic, the economic forum in Eurocities, but that they are really, really according to include the social cohesion as a really uh, uh, in the center of the economic perspective. I would like that uh, the same that Eurocity have it very, very clearly, also the European institutions had el, mm, clear when they talk about econo uh, political economy. So let's lobby, and I just to finish, we can, yeah, just to finish, uh, um, I, just, I just want to say that it is not a smart city that expels its citizen. It is not a smart the city that segregates its population. And it is not a smart city that doesn't protect the plural economy. So I think that we have to say this in the core on this, this smart city congress that they cannot forget of the, the big problems that we have now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor, and sorry for being unpolite, but we really have a, have a tight schedule. Um, just just to, to let you know, we will have a panel discussion after all our presentations, so we'll have time for discussion afterwards. But if there are some immediate questions, I can, I can have, we can have one or two immediate questions to, to the Deputy Mayor. If there is some, a burning issue, do you hear the, the, the gentleman in the back? Can you raise your arm again? Then, yeah. Hi, um, just a quick question. Uh, why does everyone have to live in the middle of the downtown? Uh, can't, uh, can't Barcelona just grow a little bit bigger and this would solve most of the problems? Um, we have a problem, a geographical problem, because Barcelona is settled. I, I, I think that we don't have a map, but Barcelona have two rivers that are the limits of the no, Besos and Llobregat. We have a mountain and we have the sea. So it's impossible to, to expand the, the city. So the density is another problem. We, we are not a planned city that can go. For example, Madrid is very different geographically uh, talking. In, but also if, if, in, if we have to design smart cities, we cannot put the people like 50 kilometers away from the from they are working, for example, because then we have climate change problems, we have mobility problems, we, fa we have all, all that. And what is really, really, I think, silly to think that we put the people that live all, all, no, all the year and that work here and we need these services, they live like uh, really far and then all the city center and all the city is just dedicated to the people that come and, and, and leave the city. And it's, I, I, I can talk a lot because the impact on social cohesion, it, we cannot stand to make a city like that. 
because it's just a segregation, uh, a segregating city, but it will be another, <laughs> another. I think we will touch on the issue of segregation later on in the discussion yeah. because it's a crucial issue. So thank you very much for now. You okay. will be back on the podium afterwards. Yeah. Uh, okay. You can also stay if you no, like. No, I can. Um, so I think uh, it was the, a perfect start start for our session because it illust illustrates that it's, we're not facing a multitude of, of problems and challenges, but if we want to address these challenges, we also need to push many, many different buttons, and I think that is what Barcelona is trying to do. So now we'll uh, shed our, uh, change our geographical focus a little bit to the north, to Paris, and I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome uh, Mr. Ian Prosat, Deputy Mayor of Par Paris in charge of housing. Please, the floor is yours. Bonjour à tous. Uh, Yann Brossa, je suis donc uh, adjoint à la maire de Paris en charge du logement et de l'hébergement uh, d'urgence. Je suis très heureux de uh, m'exprimer uh, ici à l'occasion uh, de cette conférence. Je vais concentrer uh, ma présentation sur un enjeu uh, qui se pose à nous uh, dans uh, la capitale de la France, à Paris, qui est la question du développement énorme des locations euh, touristiques euh, dans, euh, à Paris. Euh, quelques mots peut-être avant, dans le prolongement de ce qui a été dit euh, précédemment par ma collègue de Barcelone sur euh, les enjeux du logement euh, à Paris. Paris est une ville qui, comme toutes les euh, grandes métropoles du monde, est confrontée à des problèmes de logement, confrontée à euh, une crise du euh, logement. Et néanmoins, malgré toutes ces difficultés, nous avons, depuis le début des années 2000, mis en œuvre des outils visant à faire en sorte que Paris puisse à nouveau accueillir des classes moyennes et euh, des familles modestes. Cette politique du logement, qui est euh, développée depuis maintenant une quinzaine d'années par la ville de Paris, elle se traduit par la mise en place de trois outils principalement. Le premier outil, c'est le développement du logement social. Paris est une ville qui, aujourd'hui, compte 21% de logements sociaux. Nous en avions 13% au début des années 2000. Et donc, depuis 15 ans, nous avons considérablement développé notre parc de logements sociaux. Deuxièmement, nous avons mis en place, depuis maintenant deux ans, un encadrement des loyers, c'est-à-dire que les propriétaires privés n'ont pas le droit de dépasser un certain niveau de loyer dans chaque quartier de Paris, ce qui nous a permis, depuis maintenant deux ans, de stabiliser les loyers parisiens après une dizaine d'années au cours desquelles les loyers avaient augmenté de 50%. Et donc, grâce à cet encadrement des loyers, nous avons enfin des loyers qui, certes, sont élevés, mais qui ont cessé d'augmenter de manière exponentielle, comme c'était le cas au cours des années précédentes. Et puis, le troisième axe de cette politique, et j'en viens au sujet qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui, enfin en tout cas qui va faire l'objet de ma présentation, c'est la question des locations touristiques qui se développent depuis quelques années en même temps que des plateformes bien connues comme Airbnb. C'est pour nous un sujet absolument essentiel, un sujet de préoccupation majeure pour une raison toute simple, c'est que Paris est une ville qui est très dense, très pleine. C'est la ville la plus dense d'Europe. Nous avons peu de possibilités de construire des immeubles nouveaux parce qu'il y a peu de terrains disponibles. Et donc, l'un des enjeux majeurs, c'est de préserver le parc de logements existants. Les logements existants, nous considérons qu'ils doivent d'abord servir à loger des Parisiens. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle nous sommes préoccupés par le développement de ces euh, plateformes. J'en viens donc à la question qui fait l'objet euh, de euh, cette présentation euh, ce matin. Nous avons depuis maintenant euh, quelques années, environ euh, cinq ans, un développement très très important des locations touristiques euh, à Paris. Nous avons environ 300 plateformes qui proposent des locations euh, touristiques. Nous en avons euh, sur euh, Trois plateformes principalement, les trois plus importantes à Paris. La première, c'est Airbnb. 65 000 logements sont proposés à Paris sur la plateforme Airbnb qui appartiennent à 50 000 propriétaires différents, ce qui veut dire qu'un certain nombre de ces logements sont la propriété de multipropriétaires qui proposent plusieurs logements sur cette plateforme. C'est donc 5 des logements parisiens qui sont proposés sur Airbnb, ce qui est relativement important. 
Sur une autre plateforme, Abritel Homo Holidays, nous avons 14 200 logements qui sont proposés à la location à des touristes. Et sur Booking, ce sont 2 760 logements qui sont proposés. Ce développement des locations touristiques a plusieurs conséquences et sans doute l'une des conséquences majeures de ce développement, c'est que après plusieurs années d'augmentation de la population parisienne, nous avons désormais une population parisienne qui a tendance à diminuer sous la pression de ces plateformes, notamment dans les arrondissements du cœur historique de Paris, les quatre premiers arrondissements de Paris, qui sont aussi les arrondissements préférés des touristes qui viennent visiter la capitale. Je dirais donc, pour résumer les problèmes posés par le développement de ces plateformes, que cela engendre trois conséquences négatives principales. La première, c'est le manque de logement, puisque un certain nombre de propriétaires décident de transformer des logements qui, jusqu'à présent, accueillaient des habitants parisiens en location touristique, en hôtel clandestin euh, d'une certaine manière. Nous considérons que, au cours des cinq dernières années, nous avons perdu 20 000 logements, donc 20 000 logements qui étaient des logements pour des Parisiens qui ont été transformés en location euh, touristique. Deuxième problème, c'est que tout cela euh, contribue à une augmentation des prix, des prix à la vente et des prix des loyers, notamment euh, parce que la location touristique est beaucoup plus rentable que la location traditionnelle et donc tout cela nourrit la spéculation immobilière dans la capitale. Et troisième problème, ce sont des problèmes plus pratiques, plus concrets d'une certaine manière, ce sont les nuisances de voisinage liées au développement de ces locations touristiques avec des conflits d'usage dans des immeubles où des locataires qui sont des parisiens et qui doivent travailler le lendemain souvent assez tôt se plaignent du bruit liés au développement de ces locations touristiques. Tout cela fait que la ville de Paris, depuis maintenant quelques années, a essayé d'élaborer sur ce sujet, comme beaucoup d'autres villes concernées par ce problème, une politique équilibrée. Cette politique équilibrée, pour la résumer en quelques mots, elle dit deux choses. Elle dit oui à l'économie de partage, non à une économie de prédation, c'est-à-dire accepter que des propriétaires puissent louer quelques jours par an leur logement à des touristes, notamment lorsque les propriétaires partent en vacances. En revanche, nous cherchons à limiter au maximum la transformation de logements en location touristique toute l'année. C'est donc l'objet de la politique que nous avons mise en place et qui correspond à la philosophie que je viens de développer. Pour mettre en place cette politique, nous avons réalisé, je dirais, trois choses. D'abord, nous avons mis en place une réglementation qui a été adoptée par le Conseil de Paris, adoptée d'ailleurs à l'unanimité, au-delà même des clivages entre, entre la droite et la gauche du Conseil de Paris, alors même que d'habitude, les questions du logement sont plutôt... Euh, des questions euh, qui euh, font l'objet de, de, de polémiques. Mais sur cette question de la régulation des locations touristiques, il y a une relative unanimité euh, au sein du Conseil de Paris. Cette réglementation, euh, et c'est le premier pilier de notre politique, elle dit la chose suivante. Elle dit que vous avez le droit de louer votre résidence principale, si vous en êtes évidemment le propriétaire. Vous avez le droit de louer jusqu'à 120 jours par an. En revanche, vous n'avez pas le droit d'aller au-delà et par ailleurs, vous n'avez pas le droit de louer une résidence euh, secondaire. Ça, c'est la réglementation que nous avons euh, mis en place. Le deuxième pilier, c'est que nous avons mis en place des contrôles et donc nous avons une équipe au sein de la ville de Paris, trop petite à mes yeux et je pense que ces effectifs devraient être plus importants et, et, et ils seront euh, sans doute renforcés dans les années qui viennent, une équipe de 20 agents 20 contrôleurs qui sont chargés d'aller dans les immeubles, d'effectuer des contrôles et, s'ils repèrent des infractions, de transmettre euh, les dossiers euh, à la justice. Ils ont la possibilité d'entrer dans les appartements, de demander des informations euh, aux propriétaires et, par ailleurs, ils s'appuient évidemment sur euh, des enquêtes qu'ils réalisent sur euh, les différentes euh, plateformes. C'est ainsi que, depuis 2016, 8500 logements 
ont pu être contrôlés grâce à cette équipe d'agents et nous avons pu ainsi repérer un certain nombre d'infractions. Si je prends l'ensemble de l'année 2017, depuis janvier 2017, il y a eu un, quasiment un million d'euros d'amende qui ont été prononcés par les juges suite à des infractions qui ont été repérées. La nouveauté, et c'est le, le troisième pilier de notre politique de régulation que nous avons cherché à, à mettre en œuvre à Paris, c'est la mise en place, et je sais que ça existe dans d'autres villes du monde, d'un numéro d'enregistrement, une sorte de nu, numéro d'immatriculation. Il sera obligatoire à partir du 1er décembre. Il faut savoir que c'est une mesure qui euh, supposait un changement législatif en France, en général, pour mettre en, en œuvre des, des, des politiques de régulation en matière de logement. On a besoin de l'État et on a besoin de modifications législatives. Les villes n'ont pas la possibilité euh, d'agir euh, toutes seules. Nous avons donc obtenu, euh, il y a maintenant un an, le vote d'une loi qui permet aux villes de mettre en place un numéro d'enregistrement pour tous ceux qui louent leur logement sur une plateforme euh, de location touristique. Et il a fallu attendre un an, donc maintenant nous sommes quasiment à cette échéance, pour que cette mesure puisse être mise en œuvre à Paris. Et donc, à partir du 1er décembre, tout propriétaire qui souhaite louer son logement sur une plateforme de location touristique doit s'inscrire sur le site internet de la ville de Paris. C'est un site qui sera relativement simple d'accès et qui donc sera absolument obligatoire. Et dans le même temps, euh, il s'agit pour nous de responsabiliser euh, les plateformes et les plateformes, de par cette loi dont je vous ai parlé euh, tout à l'heure, les plateformes seront obligées de retirer euh, les annonces présentes plus de 120 jours, puisque je vous l'ai dit tout à l'heure, la limite fixée, elle est de, de 120 jours et vous avez donc le droit de louer jusqu'à 120 jours par an, mais vous n'avez pas le droit de dépasser euh, cette limite. Et par ailleurs, les plateformes sont obligées de ne faire figurer euh, que des annonces qui ont obtenu euh, ce numéro d'enregistrement. Ce que nous attendons de ce numéro d'enregistrement, c'est le fait d'avoir enfin un registre de l'ensemble de ces locations touristiques, puisque aujourd'hui, nous sommes confrontés euh, à un marché qui est relativement opaque, et la ville de Paris aujourd'hui n'a pas un registre exhaustif, un registre global, de l'ensemble de ces logements qui sont euh, loués sur euh, des plateformes. Voilà ce que, ce que je voulais vous dire en termes de, de présentation globale. Pour finir, euh, je voudrais conclure sur une chose, c'est que je, je suis profondément convaincu que sur cette question de la régulation des locations touristiques, l'un des enjeux majeurs, c'est ce que les villes sont capables de construire ensemble. Moi, je suis frappé en discutant avec mes collègues des autres grandes villes, des villes touristiques, des villes confrontées à des problèmes de logement, je suis très frappé par le fait que nous tous sommes confrontés globalement aux mêmes problèmes, que nous cherchons tous à élaborer des outils de régulation, mais finalement, nous coopérons assez peu. Et je suis convaincu que nous avons beaucoup à gagner, à dialoguer ensemble, sur ces sujets et à construire des solutions communes parce que c'est aussi ce qui nous permettra d'obtenir un certain nombre de choses des, des, des plateformes. Je prends, un, et, et, et ce sera ma conclusion, l'exemple de, de Paris. Je constate qu'à Paris, nous avons jusqu'à présent obtenu moins de choses des plateformes que d'autres villes, comme Amsterdam par exemple, qui ont obtenu davantage que nous. Et donc, si nous sommes capables de nous organiser, je pense que nous serons évidemment plus efficace et nous obtiendrons davantage d'outils de régulation parce que nous aurons obtenu un rapport de force qui nous sera plus favorable. Voilà, merci à tous. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think uh, the, the point you touched uh, at, at the end, the city cooperation is obviously crucial. 
because we have so many uh, cities struggling with uh, with the issue of short-term rental. And actually, it's also it, it, it's it's kind of funny that an idea which used to be a smart idea, the short-term rental in terms of using resources properly, living like a local, has developed into something which is creating huge problems for our city. So, same procedure as before. If there are one or two immediate questions, I, I can take them. Otherwise, we will go to the next presentations. Any immediate questions? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a question. Thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. Have you made any estimation about how much it costs uh, the lack of regulation of short-term lettings in a city? How much it costs a budget? Is there a number, any number that you can recall or any proceedings you're making to, to prove economically that it's such a viable cause? Um. Vous dire quel est le coût de, 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 de tout cela est compliqué. D'ailleurs, il faudrait sans doute avoir un, un jugement balancé sur le sujet parce que des plateformes comme Airbnb rapportent aussi de l'argent à la ville de Paris, notamment parce que ces plateformes permettent de faire venir à Paris des touristes qui sans doute n'auraient pas la possibilité d'y venir dans des hôtels traditionnels parce que le coût des hôtels traditionnels est euh, trop élevé. En revanche, et là je rejoins les aspects plus négatifs, ce que nous savons, c'est que depuis cinq ans, à Paris, sous la pression de ces plateformes, nous avons perdu 20 000 logements. Et perdre 20 000 logements dans une ville comme Paris, c'est considérable. Simplement, un élément de comparaison, chaque année à Paris, nous construisons 4 000 logements neufs, uniquement. Donc cela signifie que nous avons perdu autant de logements que nous avons gagné. C'est-à-dire que globalement, nous construisons 4 000 logements par an et chaque année, 4 000 logements sont transformés en location touristique. Ce qui veut dire que le bilan, au final, est nul euh, puisque le nombre de logements produits en plus a été annihilé, a été euh, euh, supprimé euh, par euh, la transformation de logements euh, en location touristique. Donc il s'agit évidemment d'un problème important qui a des conséquences financières, notamment sur le budget de la ville de Paris, puisque les 20 000 personnes que nous ne pouvons plus loger dans ces locations, euh, euh, dans, dans ces logements qui étaient des, des locations traditionnelles avant, nous sommes obligés de les loger autrement, notamment par le développement de logements sociaux euh, dans la capitale. Un élément sur le budget du logement de la ville de Paris, chaque année, la ville de Paris investit pour le logement, et notamment pour le logement social, 500 millions d'euros par an et c'est le premier budget de la ville de Paris donc c'est une dépense qui est euh, extrêmement importante. Thanks for now. You will be back for for the discussion, for the podium discussion. Uh, we have now three more uh, presentations from 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 three different cities. Oh, sorry, I don't think the headset anymore. Um, Uh, so we have three more presentations from these three different cities. That is Amsterdam. We're going to deepen our knowledge a little bit more on Barcelona and Vienna. Uh, and all of the three presentations will be short and sharp, that we have enough time for the presentation. So now I'm very happy to introduce uh, Mr. Kis Dignum from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, he is uh, actually the coordinator for research and development uh, of the city of Amsterdam in, 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 uh, in the field of housing. And Kis, I'm looking forward to your words. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, welcome here um, and uh, good afternoon here. Um, my name is Kees Dichem from the housing department of uh, Amsterdam. Uh, I called my uh, presentation Counterbalancing the Market, uh, the social housing sector in Amsterdam. Um, I realize that Amsterdam is in a very uh, uh, prosperous position to having a very uh, strong uh, social housing sector still um, and uh, understanding the the problems here in Barcelona in in creating a social housing stock um, yeah puts Amsterdam in a very special position and and, uh, and and feeling lucky that we have a long history of um, building and creating and uh, retaining that social housing stock. Um, and perhaps that long history is also the reason uh, why we have that social housing uh, sector. I won't go in 
to that history very long. I want to come out to the present time uh, also, where we are in that position or in that um, um, in that position to counterbalancing the market pressures, which are very strong also on Amsterdam. Um, holiday uh, lets and also buy to let um, developments in Amsterdam are also very uh, vivid and strong nowadays. So we experience also a very strong uh, price trend in Amsterdam, which is very, which makes also the um, the sector of social housing very important uh, to retain, and we feel pressure to uh, to retain also a strong middle segment, and especially the middle segment of the housing market now for us is a thing which is um, very vulnerable of disappearing. Everything is going. Um, um, getting very very um, expensive very easily. Um, so I will tell you about something about the long year trend, the situation in 2017 now and something about the future. Um, I told you about that far, few, far uh, past. We started building our social housing uh, stock already in the 19th century. Um, and you can see in this picture that uh, Amsterdam was not as prosperous and, and as uh, and a good-looking city as it is uh, nowadays. Uh, there were very good reasons to build the social housing sector because um, health and uh, and uh, quality, uh, the quality of housing conditions was really at stake at that time. So uh, industrialization had become. Uh, 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 affecting Amsterdam in the 1870s also. So there was a, a dense uh, population, population growth in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, um, affecting the health situation of people. So Amsterdam and some, also some private organizations took their responsibility to say, well, we need special housing for the poor uh, people, for the, for the health of the people, especially to, um, to have uh, any workers left uh, for the future, because it's, uh, it was affecting also the, uh, the workers' capacity for the industrialization. Um, so I have... Um, decided to, to, to uh, in my presentation for the social housing festival I uh, divided uh, Amsterdam uh, history in about 10 decades I won't go in uh, to that now for in detail but you can see in every of these decades Amsterdam was building social housing in the orange color you can see um, the amount of social housing that was added in all these decades after um, 1900. Uh, so already in the first decades of the 20th, 20th century, Amsterdam was big in building social housing. And especially after, after the Second World War, um, when the, the war took his uh, um, um, uh, took his loss in uh, in uh, in Amsterdam, and many of the houses um, went down in quality again. Amsterdam decided to uh, to build very uh, much and uh, and predominantly in social housing. Um, we um, did that a bit slowly, slowlier uh, after the 1970s. Uh, Amsterdam saw Amsterdam was building, uh, not building anymore after the 1970s because uh, it let the growth of Amsterdam actually not uh, happen in Amsterdam itself, but in the suburban uh, uh, suburban places. Uh, you can see that Amsterdam had its uh, population peak in uh, 1959. It reached. Um, 872,000 inhabitants at that time, but after that, uh, in every year, Amsterdam lost about 10,000 inhabitants a year to their um, surrounding municipalities. And uh, Amsterdam did not do much about that. It was not a very important uh, matter at that time. But uh, in the 1980s, uh, up to the 1990s, Amsterdam said, well, that uh, that uh, development is going too fast. We are losing too many people to the suburbs, and we are losing too many people with a, uh, with a good income also to the, uh, to the suburbs. Amsterdam was um, becoming a very poor uh, um, uh, city, uh, actually. 
um, and we were realizing that we uh, needed more mix, ne needed more diversity in our housing stock. Uh, so you can see here in this diagram where the red line is Amsterdam and the, the black line is the Netherlands. I have, I've put it in index uh, figures that Amsterdam was losing. This is the average income of um, people in Amsterdam compared to uh, the people in the Netherlands. That Amsterdam was losing um, uh, in average income every year after the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so, so that the uh, responsibility of Amsterdam to build again and to, uh, to create some competition against the suburban places um, was also a matter of repairing the income gap which was uh, being created uh, at, the, at the decades of suburbanization. And you can see even now at 2013, 15, 17 or so, uh, five, five minutes, okay, um, that that gap is not repaired uh, uh, still. Um, this is the metropolitan area of Amsterdam, 32 uh, municipalities working together, uh, once competitors in, in, in housing, now working together more or less. Um, an, a new OECD report say, says, well, there is some vulnerability in that working together. You, perhaps you need more, um, more steering in that working together, but still we do that. Um, we are, we are changing fastly, and we uh, say, well, the economy of, uh, of Amsterdam and the Netherlands is um, um, more developing in the direction of uh, changing production structure, more importance of the service sector, cultural sector, the leisure sector happening in every uh, European city, um, um, working towards a global economy, no longer a worker city, but a city for knowledge and culture. Um, we we said it is no we we don't have to rely on that social housing sector so strongly as we did in the in the past. It is not a shame to uh, to to sell some of our, our social housing stock and to convert some of our social housing stock to the private rental market, and we did for many years. As you can see, the the grey. Uh, uh, the gray lines. Um, so we had we had a private-owned sector in Amsterdam in 1995 of only 10%, and we have now 30%. The social social um, rented sector of housing associations was at that time almost 60%, and it is now. 45% or so. So we are changing our housing structure in the direction of more diversity. And we need that, that diversity, you can see that in our income structure, to, um, um, to be able to um, house our different, different income groups. So you can see that the, um, uh, the private owned sector uh, has um, uh, an income far far above uh, the average of Amsterdam, that the private rental sector is just um, uh, on uh, the average income of Amsterdam itself, and the, private, and the social rental sector is far below that. So we have that diversity in income groups very strongly here in, uh, in Amsterdam in our um, three sectors. Um, but pr prices are strongly rising nowadays in Amsterdam. You can see the green line for the recent years, 2013-15. Amsterdam, um, Amsterdam is very fast growing in, in, uh, um, in the price trends, which is affecting the, 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 the home ownership, but also the private rental sector, especially. The social rental sector can be protected for, that, for these price trends in a way. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, there is scarcity also in our social sector. Um, I have to make make a bit of um, of a hurry. Um, we had a. Um, a government in the last few years, which was operating in the crisis years, which, which say, well, Rich, let's reorganize the housing market uh, in these days. And that re reorganization was more in the direction of a uh, private market again. Uh, so um, um, the national government was not helping the Amsterdam situation for many years, uh, actually. Um, 
in the mail of yesterday I saw that um, the new government which is uh, installed uh, uh, a, few, a, few, a few weeks ago um, um, is promising some, some betterment on that uh, theme. So I'm uh, really curious about uh, the, the, the coming developments. Um, well, uh, even our, um, our bigger national advice bureaus say, well, it is not only a matter of housing affordability, but it is also a matter of, uh, of our income structure, which has uh, come to um, uh, some sort of disbalance. So we, they, these uh, uh, advisory boards say, well, uh, the um, the income uh, situation in uh, in uh, the Netherlands, especially on the lower side of the income uh, um, division, needs uh, some sort of um, uh, activation. We, uh, there should be more. Uh, there should be higher incomes in the lower segments. Um, and especially this minister uh, of uh, of housing took advantage of the situation to reorganize the, um, the housing market in a very liberal way the last years. Um, we are on a changing point uh, now. We, we came from uh, a situation in which repairing the income ga gap was very important to um, a situation where, we, where diminishing ac accessibility is the case actually today. Uh, so gentrification was for um, many years actually helping our um, diverse diversity in neighborhoods, and we were rather proud, proud to create this diversity. Um, nowadays, we need, uh, 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 we are more in need for our social housing sector, and we are very reluctant uh, nowadays to uh, to sale. And we have, uh, we had a, a deputy mayor, a deputy mayor in Amsterdam for the last four years, which was very critical on sale of social housing and uh, of converting social housing to the private rental market. Affordability is really a rising problem uh, nowadays. We have that, um, that big uh, biannual research in Amsterdam, uh, living in Amsterdam, and uh, we can monitor our um, stock in comparison to the income structure uh, every two years very sharply and that gives us uh, the opportunity to um, uh, uh, to give uh, proper figures in our negotiations with uh, the housing uh, associations and these um, I'll skip a few these um, um, agreements with the housing associations now are very important uh, to us. And our deputy mayor also says, well, uh, our housing associations are the real partners in uh, getting balance in our uh, housing, system, uh, housing system, in counterbalancing the market, actually. Building, we, uh, we are in the opportunity to build, and we found many spaces here in Amsterdam to um, to build five or six thousand uh, dwellings a year for the future, uh, but the real problem is that prices rise very fastly, and um, uh, square meter prices go f uh, go up very fast. So my problem for uh, the future is: will be able to buy uh, or to create affordable houses with a bigger space, especially for families, because when you don't have families in your city, um, livability is on stake. Um, well, I see you standing there already, uh, Herbert. Uh, I see a lot of these things which, uh, which are affecting our um, future. Um, um, there is a lot of pressure in, our, in Amsterdam, um, and we still, yeah, we still have our uh, natural partner, partners, the housing associations, to make it right. Yes, I'd like to leave it there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Again, sorry for being impolite, but that, that's, that's, where, that's the job of the moderator. Um, yeah. We will have you back at the, at the discussion afterwards, yes. and I would just immediately uh, come uh, back actually to Barcelona, and I'm happy to welcome uh, Mr. Javier Boron, uh, who is the housing manager of the city of Barcelona and the vice chair of the working group housing in Eurocities. Javier, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everybody. In first, the first thing that I have to say is that 
while the presentation is being loaded, uh, to speak in between uh, Amsterdam and Vienna. For a tennis fan like me, it's like speaking between Roland Garros and Wimbledon. And it's kind of difficult to talk about what we are trying to do right now in Barcelona when there are cities that they, they state that they have a crisis in their, in their affordable uh, housing uh, systems. Uh, and their, crash, their crisis compared to our situation uh, uh, is uh, very advantageous. So I will try to um, tell you what we are trying to do. Uh, if the presentation is loaded, okay. If it's not, it's not a problem because I will, I will continue f uh, from the point where Laia left the presentation. I was uh, uh, asked if I could briefly uh, speak about new players in the field of affordable housing uh, and strengths and weakness of these new players and the things that uh, uh, we are trying to do or we are doing. In first, in first place, I have to say that the situation, the previous situation, the situation, for example, in the last decade is that we had a very residual uh, housing uh, uh, public policy. Just to give you one example, in the city of Barcelona, uh, nowadays we, have, we still have uh, less than 2% of the total stock is uh, run under uh, rules different to the market. Uh, it's a stock that is public or private uh, with non-profit or limited profit uh, aim. And for example, we just have seen uh, the case of Amsterdam. They are crying bitterly because they have only 35%. Uh, the main drive of the administration was to sell public land in order to get money to finance other public policies. Uh, the action uh, of administrations in terms of housing was almost all, not all, but almost all, uh, directed to ownership. The Vivienda Protegida, which is the type of subsidized housing that we have in Spain, it was mainly done for sale. Uh, we barely have no rental, no social, public, or affordable rental sector. And of course, we didn't have any PPPs on affordable rental. And the rehabilitation policies, it was uh, dr driven mainly uh, to uh, public subsidies, allowances, and uh, this type of uh, schemes. Uh, the city of Barcelona right now has 70% uh, of owners, 30% of uh, tenants, and is the city in, the, uh, in, in Spain with the highest uh, share of uh, rental. And as I told you, only 2% uh, of, the, of the total is uh, non-market uh, housing. What are the main drivers right now in terms of uh, uh, affordable housing provision? The first one is uh, to retain the public land. We don't sell land anymore. Uh, we give land in leasehold or we uh, retain line, land for ourselves. And this is a very interesting starting point because if you don't have enough land, you won't be able to pursue any policy. The second thing is that uh, as far as we can, in all the projects that we are involved, 80% of the result will be rental and 20% will be leasehold. This is a major shift in the way uh, things were approached uh, in the previous decade. And the second thing is that 63% uh, of our objectives will be uh, pursued, they will be done through public means, through the, uh, uh, um, the, the housing agent, municipal housing agency, which it will be called next month, Institut Municipal de, de Habitatge y Rehabilitació. Uh, but the other 30, 37% will be done uh, by uh, means of collaboration with different type of entities. And this is, these are the new players that I have been uh, uh, told to speak about. First of all, we have to say that there is a major change in the uh, landscape in the private sector. Most of the companies, they bankrupt. They, they are not working anymore. The number of companies is extremely uh, inferior to, to what we had before. Uh, and there has been a renewal in the type of companies that we have operating in the market. First of all, we have uh, investment funds, very active, and we didn't have them at, at this scale before. Secondly, we have companies uh, directly owned or related to banks. 
because after the bailout, uh, the banks, they were the major holders of equity in terms of uh, real estate. And in third place, we have m medium to small traditional companies that they were able to survive to the crisis. Uh, and uh, they are playing a, a bigger role now because they are still there operating. These companies, this, this new landscape, uh, at least is willing to talk, and I stress the word, to talk about affordable rental, affordable housing, rehabilitation, and public-private uh, partnership. We still don't have many projects of this going on, but it's very significant that in uh, professional meetings, the private partners are using our language, the language of the administration, of the public companies, of the NGOs, or, or, on the, of, or of the uh, limited profit companies. This is important, and we have to take advantage of this. We have to be intelligent, we have to be able to cooperate, we have to be able to merger. And you, you only cooperate and merger with people who are different uh, to you, admitting that you will have to uh, reduce your level of, of, of expectancy and, of, uh, uh, and, and your demands. You have to meet also their standards. Uh, second thing that uh, I could say about players, since we are giving land in leasehold in a, in a significant amount uh, to private parties who want to engage in the development of affordable housing, we are creating a micro market. We are creating opportunities for the following types of uh, players. Cooperatives that exist during the promotion of during the development, uh, during the building of the, uh, of the stock and that they uh, disappear afterwards. We can call them cooperatives for promotion. The change, uh, the major change is that in the past, these cooperatives, they were building uh, in a cooperative way houses for sale. They were building a vivienda protegida to sell afterwards. Now uh, they will sell only the right of surface, the, the leasehold. We will retain the land because the land is ours. We give it to a cooperative in a leasehold and the cooperative when produce, after he, uh, the, the company produces the building, again sells the leasehold to the final users. This is one way to, 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 to work. The second thing that we are doing and the second type of player that is appearing is uh, co-housing. We call it cohabitacha here in Barcelona and it means a group of people who get together in order to have a communitarian project uh, that has to do with uh, housing and with living, but with all the things as well. And this, uh, the result, architecturally speaking, of these uh, buildings uh, is, uh, is a very artisan product. But it has to do with the demands and with the expectancies of this group. We provide for la with the land and we provide with uh, technical support during the development of these uh, projects. The third type of uh, player are the foundations. We don't have many foundations active in the field of uh, housing here in, in Barcelona, but we have some, and we have agreed that if we give them land, again in leasehold, a leasehold of, for 75 years, and we provide with some aid, around 20% of the budget of the, of the total project, they are willing to do rental. In this case, they will construct and manage vivienda protegida, subsidized housing in rental, for 75 years. This is very interesting because it's exactly the same work that we do in the, in the public municipal agency, but run through foundations with a, less, uh, with, with a minor consumption of uh, public uh, resources. Five minutes, yes. And, um, and the fourth and previous to last thing or last player that we are uh, working with are NGOs. We have uh, a specific program for mobilization of vacant uh, housing and uh, to use that housing uh, for, um, for, uh, for affordable rental, for social rental, with an NGO called Habitat 3, which it itself is a foundation uh, created by all the NGOs of Catalonia. It's still a very experimental project, but it's working well and uh, we are maintaining and growing uh, the project. And the last thing that we are doing, uh, which uh, it, could it could see, it could look, or you could uh, judge it as very pro-corporate, but we are uh, absolutely persuaded that we, as, as Laia said before, that we have to do 
bottom-up efforts and co-habitat, uh, co-housing foundations, cooperatives, probably is, is a, is a bottom-up effort trying to uh, create a network of opportunities and projects that can be replicated afterwards, but we need time to evolve that model. But we also need a strategy that is uh, uh, up-down. Uh, up and this strategy, strategy is to create a public-private company, a metropolitan company, because the 50% of the equity, the public equity, will be held by the uh, uh, metropolitan authority and the, other, and, 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 the, and the municipality. The other 50 will be selected through a tender process to a public uh, procurement process. And the idea is to develop uh, rental in the plots of land that we, we will uh, hand again in leasehold. So it's not very different in, the, in terms of operations to other methods that we are using, but it's very different in the size because we are looking, we will provide with 64 million euros plus land. We are looking for another 64 million euros to be deposited uh, through, uh, in three occasions through five years. And we know that the European Bank of Investment is ready or willing to back this operation with uh, 240 million euros. So we will uh, gather an operation of, of 400 million euros to develop between 3,000 and 4,500 units. The combination of all these uh, uh, should be able to create a model of small projects working in process and at the same time big projects ready to be replicated in the city of Barcelona, in the metropolitan area and in other places. In order to fill that immense gap between 2% of impact in the market that we have right now and the 35% of, uh, of uh, Amsterdam and the uh, almost 60% of Vienna. The gap is so immense that we have to create tools in order to be able to uh, uh, speed up phases. Just a few last remark. Uh, strengths and uh, weaknesses of these strategies. The first thing that I have to say about uh, uh, weaknesses is that for us, a city with not a long tradition in housing, is quite difficult to implement many strategies at the same time with very uh, scarce resources and, and with a sentiment of loneliness. We are not being accompanied by other administrations. Moreover, other administrations are withdrawing their action from the, from the field of, of housing. So probably the, 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 the biggest problem is that even though in Barcelona we sometimes think that we are a state, we are not. We are only a city, an important city, but a city and we rely also on other administrations and we are not being uh, helped as much as we should. And in terms of advantages, I would say that money is out there. There is, there is uh, liquidity out there looking for good projects. And the good projects to make sense, we can uh, articulate them with the uh, rhetoric of the administrations and of the politicians, and then we won't make any uh, PPP. So we have to make an effort to structureize our projects in order to be understandable by the market and to meet the needs of both parties. The markets need to get uh, profits, and they, they are looking for security, certainty, guarantees. They are looking to uh, pursue a very boring business, which is rent houses, to normal people who, who pay their normal rents. And we have to adjust our action to the fact that the markets are demanding that. And the other thing that we have to do, which is quite complex, and um, I, it will be my last remark, and I hope that I don't upset my own team, is that uh, within civil servants, there is a tendency to believe that only 100% public action is the way to uh, face uh, public policy problems. So when you uh, develop a, a, a set of tools where you have the, the, uh, the desire to implement many PPPs, sometimes you have s senior civil servants uh, not very active, at least in the first stages. So 
The other cultural challenge is to convince uh, the great working and professional teams that we have in some administrations that this is a way to extend, to enlarge the scope of our action and is not a way to diminish our capacities. And this is not simple. It's easy to say and difficult to do. And, uh, and that will be it. And according to my, my watch, I only used 14 minutes and 20 seconds, which is not bad. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for sticking to the time set. That's great. So um, last but not least, uh, we, uh, we will have uh, a look at, at the Viennese model, which was already mentioned. And again, I ask Susanne Bauer, uh, chair of the working group housing, to the podium to give, to give this input. Response, sorry. Mm, we had that. So go for, I can't see it now. It's this one. I think we already got it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so I'm allowed to speak uh, about Vienna now, what I'm happily going to do. I have to be very brief, I was told. So first of all, I want to make, just to give some information. Vienna right now has got 1.8 million inhabitants. We are approaching the two millions. And what's really, really important, we are part of a region. Because if we are speaking about a growing city and we are growing about 25 up to 30,000 persons per year, then we are also talking about boundaries. That comes where the region comes in. As I said, we are a growing city, but it has not always been a growing city. That means there have been times when we were thinking, now we are growing permanently. And there are some demographical trends. We also talked this morning about a society getting older. That means there are more ego, more single persons in our society. And we are not just growing older in Vienna, we are also growing younger at the same time. So what are the consequences for building? This is my question. Another trend is we heard this this morning already the average income is stagnating, so people do not have more money. They are lucky if they can maintain their level they've got right now. Generally speaking, there are hardly any offers of affordable housing on the private market. That means altogether we have got an increasing pressure on the affordable housing market. Um, now, what's our housing structure in Vienna? The good though, first of all, 77% of all people in Vienna live in tenants. So that's a very high rate of tenancy. We've got 33% is the private market, and then actually get interesting, because 20% belong to cooperatives, limited profit housing associations, and the city of Vienna itself owns 25% of the municipal housing. We've got residential property, home ownership, and also others. So city of Vienna is in the really lucky situation that it owns itself 220,000 units, housing units, and another 200,000 are owned by cooperatives as a subsidized uh, part. That means altogether 45% are owned either by the city or by its allies, the not-for-profit housing association. We are in the lucky situation that no privatization of our stock took place. And we have got a social mixing all over the city. That means all over uh, Vienna you will find subsidized housing or municipal housing. Very important is the legal framework. I'm just going to mention it. Because the thing what we are talking about 
is the or the red one is the limited housing act which makes sure what are the rights and duties of limited housing companies we've got here in the green print a so called rent act on the one side the rent act is there to protect tenants however we do have some problems on the private market because the private market allows temporary rental contracts whereas in the subsidized and municipal housing sector it's only long term contract there's no short term at all it's different on the private housing market because when we're coming to airbnb this gets some relevance so there should be some way of uh, reform in this respect last but not least we've got the viennese housing promotion and renovation act and this is the basis how we finance our housing and we how we finance the gentle urban renewal as i said for us it's very important to cooperate closely with the limited profit housing associations you've seen there's a legal act the owners of this housing association are for example municipalities but also the financing sector and it's what's very important limited profit housing associations they shall make profit but profits have to be reinvested so we are also going into stock in and, and also in new affordable housing and it's a very low profit distribution to owners if so at all to be honest and rents have to be just a cost coverage principle that means they are really much cheaper than on the uh, private market and there has to be a very strict audit and control so one good question is how do we finance all our um, stock we have so it's almost for 100 years vienna and the republic of austria has had a tax so it's really going back in history it's a contribution of employees and um, employers of 0.5% each of gross pay so every year we've got maybe know more or less how much money we can get and what we can calculate with our emphasis is on the object side so it is 267 million go into new construction and about 191 million is for subsidized renovation last but not least there is subject funding of 110 million euro per year for individuals those who need those who are in need for example single parents elderly person or young person that's the mix we have got for our subsidized housing so to sum up this part of my presentation as i said we've got city of vienna owns 220000 council flats that we maintain it and the administration is up to us the, on the promotion of urban renewal we do have the gentle urban renewal for 9000 flats per year and the subsidized housing construction is about 7000 dwellings per year with a stock of 200000 dwellings and the interesting thing is our city councilor told us we have to become much quicker we have to build much more those this is our homework um, i'll tell you next time how we if we could meet the target however at the same time we do have some bottlenecks and one of these the really increasing increasing price of land as you can see it's really creating a severe problem we've got less quantity of land so less building land is available this is uh, the local circumstances and if i talk about european level we've got the long term investment which is normal for social housing worth the growth and stability pact and also the service of general interest which is called state aid versus the principle of subsidiarity so what are the new players on the scene one well not new but still very active player is the airbnb we estimate that about one up to two per mil of the housing stock are used we also estimate that about 2000 units are misused misused to be understood they are rented on a permanent basis not to tenants but on uh, airbnb or other platforms so what has been the city of vienna doing we started an information campaign just last year
with some questions. So if informing about the restricted right to subletting, question, is the tourist tax paid or has it been paid? Would a business license be necessary? We have to have statistical data. You made it absolutely clear in your presentation right before me. And there is a compulsory registration. The term is Meldepflicht. We do have first successes. There are more Airbnb landlords and ladies pay the tourist tax, but this is just the beginning. What are further steps? About only half, or already half, of the 16 platforms cooperate with the city of Vienna, especially in the question of data exchange. This is really a problem due to all the laws we have to obey. However, the city considers, considers penalties for platforms which do not cooperate, and there's a really high discussion going on that there's strictly no Airbnb use for housing units that were subsidized. So that means in the Viennese context, the housing units, municipal housing units we own, it's already forbidden, and we can get very, very strict on that. However, if you go to the subsidized sector, it might be possible. It depends on your contract. We want to make sure whenever we do give a subsidy, please be aware this is not this housing unit. It's not for Airbnb because it was built with public money. So if you can see on the other side, I want to make clear that tourism is a real important economic force, also driver, in Vienna, in Austria. So we are happy for people who come to all our beautiful cities, spend their money and probably have some kind of exchange. So I'm, we are not against these platforms. We simply make, want to make sure that they are playing to the rules. And while I only got 10 minutes, I say thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Susanne. Please stay, stay on the podium. Um, I would ask now all the, the speakers to come back on the podium for our, for our discussion. So thank you very much for, for that broad overview, which uh, very uh, um, lively demonstrated all the, the different approaches cities are um, actually taking. Um, and I would, as our time is, is quite limited, I would like to, to pick up one particular important issue, and that is the issue of um, private investment coming into our city. Uh, and how to deal with this private investment. This private investment can be Airbnb. This is also a sort of, 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 of investment. Uh, uh, but it can also be a new form of, uh, of, ha of housing corporations, of banks, of other, of other institutions who uh, develop an interest into social housing as, or in rental housing, as, as Javier mentioned. Uh, and for me, the cru crucial question is now that as there is money out there, to invest in our cities. The crucial issue is uh, how do we develop the framework conditions for this investment to take place? Uh, so I would like to pick up what Javier said is that um, we have institutions which might be interested in, uh, in, 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 in investing into housing, into investing into affordable housing. And I would like to know if the other um, uh, experts on the podium share the view of Javier that there is a change in the landscape, that new players uh, arrive and new players with, different in, uh, new, with new interests arrive, which are more compatible to the interests of the city. First of all, and the second of all, uh, second second point would be if there are in your cities already some concrete examples of how this new form of public-private partnership or public-plural partnership with the civil society is actually taking place. I want. Do you want to start? I I will try. I think that that this public private cooperation um, just just looking at the intervention of, from Vienna Amsterdam or even Paris we Europe have a long tradition of this kind of cooperation it's impossible to have up to the 60% of the of the housing stock 
no? In a regulated place, if we don't, if you don't cooperate with the the, the private sector, also in this kind of culture of, of that we need these institutions and with and these these rules that we share, that it's a good practice that the source, the the house the right to housing, all work together for for that. The thing is that in Barcelona we haven't. The, mm, Till, till now, and now we are starting doing, doing that. And that's why when we were preparing this new instrument, no, the Housing Association a Metropolitan, that's why we have been, uh, mm, so, mm, first of all, uh, Javier has been doing mm, um, traveling all mm, in, in Europe to, to talk to, to possible investments. People that already know that there is a social uh, aim uh, in this, in this, uh, in that investment, that you are not going to to gain a rentability of the 20 percent, that the rentability is going to be um, okay, no, but not uh, in a speculation. The 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 bad news is that in Spain and in the big cities like Barcelona, we don't have this culture, this tradition, and it's very difficult to change the mentality that people that have been gaining a lot no, before the crisis, and now they see that the only sector that is uh, uh, increasing again all the prices is also the, the housing sector. And it's not easy. So for that is that why we, we really demand a municipality network that go together with with with, with that, no, with this kind of, of vision, and to learn from others, and I think that is, is really crucial. Other comments on that issue? Um, I will speak French, okay? <laughs> um, D'abord, la la ville de Paris. Um, Elle a défini sa stratégie dans son rapport avec le secteur privé en, en rejetant au fond deux, deux hypothèses possibles. D'abord, nous n'avons pas décidé de racheter l'ensemble des logements de Paris parce que nous n'aurions pas les moyens financiers de le faire. Et deuxièmement, nous n'avons pas décidé non plus d'être dans une logique de déréglementation totale. Et notre politique est une politique qui vise à trouver un point d'équilibre qui fasse que l'investissement privé en matière de logement se poursuive à Paris, mais en trouvant des outils qui nous permettent de promouvoir un investissement responsable. Je donnerai deux exemples de ce que nous avons essayé de faire en partenariat avec le secteur privé. D'abord, premièrement, comme beaucoup d'autres villes, nous avons beaucoup de logements vacants à Paris, de logements vides. Nous avons sur 1 million 200 000 logements, 100 000 logements à Paris qui sont vides. Et nous avons, sur cette question des logements vides par exemple, mis en place un système qui fait que euh, nous aidons des propriétaires qui acceptent de remettre en location euh, leur logement euh, à des prix en dessous du prix du marché, à des prix 20% en dessous du prix du marché, en échange de quoi nous les aidons financièrement par euh, euh, des subventions de la ville de Paris à réaliser des travaux dans leur euh, appartement. Parce que souvent... Les propriétaires refusent de louer parce que leurs logements sont en mauvais état. Et donc, grâce à ces subventions qui peuvent aller jusqu'à 13 000 euros par appartement, les propriétaires remettent leur logement en location. Et ainsi, ces logements profitent à des familles de la classe moyenne. Et nous avons d'ailleurs réalisé ce projet en partenariat avec les réseaux d'agences immobilières parisiens. C'est le premier exemple de ce que nous avons fait en matière de partenariat avec le secteur privé. Deuxième exemple, c'est la question euh, des immeubles de bureaux vides. Paris est une ville qui compte 1 million de mètres carrés de bureaux vides. Ce sont des bureaux qui existent, qui ont été construits dans les années 50 et 60 notamment, et qui n'ont plus d'usage euh, aujourd'hui. C'est évidemment un problème, et la population parisienne est à juste titre scandalisée par le fait que euh, ces immeubles n'ont plus d'utilité. Et nous avons donc décidé, par exemple sur cette question, de mettre en place une nouvelle fiscalité pour inciter, euh, la transforma pour inciter à la transformation de ces immeubles de bureaux vides qui ne correspondent plus aux besoins des entreprises en euh, logement. Cette fiscalité, elle fonctionne de deux manières, positive, négative. Positive d'une part avec une fiscalité réduite 
pour les investisseurs qui transforment ces immeubles de bureaux euh, en logements et une part euh, plus, euh, euh, comment dire, punitive avec une fiscalité euh, plus dure pour les propriétaires de ces immeubles de bureaux qui laissent euh, ces immeubles de bureaux vides et qui n'engagent pas des travaux pour les transformer euh, en logements. Voilà deux exemples sur les logements vacants et sur les bureaux vacants de ce que la ville de Paris a cherché à faire pour construire un partenariat intelligent avec le secteur privé qui vise à créer de l'investissement responsable, de l'investissement vers du logement abordable, notamment pour, pour la classe moyenne. Tax incentives are definitely one key element in, in, in talking about the correct framework conditions. Um, Susanne, um, I would li like to ask you about uh, how we kind of do it in Vienna currently to, uh, to get to a new level of cooperation with the, with the private sector in, in building homes and houses. And probably you can say something about this new instrument or quite new instrument about urban development contracts. So thanks about that for us. Yeah, there is one quite successful PPP model on the affordable housing sector. So actually right now we are building 6,250 units over a period, I think, of five years. And private investors do get a loan from the city of Vienna and they have to accept a rent threshold. That means they're only allowed to charge right now, 7 euro 50, so which is our level, we say, you are not allowed to go over this margin. And on the private market, I can tell you can earn much, much more. However, while they get our, uh, or while they take our subsidy, they do agree, there are change, changes later on. But right now, for the next 10 years, that's quite clear. There is um, a private partner which means we are not under the stability and growth pact and we can build more than we could if we, were, if we would only do it with uh, subsidized money. However, we have to move forward, we have to develop forward and there are also the temporary, how can you say, urban contracts, which means we try to attract private investors to help to build the social or the infrastructure around. That's a quite new model for Vienna. We've had, I think, two or three contracts right now. Unfortunately, we do not have any evaluation. So I see this is one model. We're working it through, but I do not can tell you if it will run smoothly or not. But the interesting thing probably to add to that is that uh, we, also, we also had a discussion yesterday on, on the question of uh, what, what can we demand from private investors. And it, it, was put a, it was a discussion on the podium yesterday and you mentioned it also. So there is money out there, a lot of money out there and the market is very much interested in investing into, into our cities. And what we witnessed in Vienna, we had lengthy discussions about what can we demand from an investor in terms of uh, contributing to social infrastructure, to green infrastructure, to technical infrastructure, but also contributing of course to affordable housing. Uh, and in the end, it turned out, well, we can demand quite a lot because this is still an attractive place to invest. And I think that, that it's, it is true for Paris and Barcelona and Amsterdam and many, many other cities. So I think cities can be quite self-confident in, in that way. Uh, I'd like to, to ask Kees, in, I know that um, in Amsterdam you're, you're trying for, for a couple of years to kind of incentivize the, the, the private sector in, to build uh, affordable homes or homes for, for middle class people. Can you just give a, a few, um, yeah, few words on how this is working? Yes, um, private investors are really uh, have the intention to uh, invest in Amsterdam and also to create uh, affordable uh, uh, dwellings, um, and and they do, um, and sometimes in combination with housing associations on uh, on the same location. Um, but uh, the the problem for me with these uh, um, investment intentions is that the the dwellings they intend to create are rather small um, because of the house uh, because of the land prices at the locations they are aiming to uh, to build are rather high there so um, the consequence of that is that you uh, that they only build for small households uh, and um, they are very selective in the, uh, to the locations they want to invest uh, to uh, so uh, the um, um, what we like to see is that uh, we uh, um, 
agree to the location they want to invest in, but also to uh, look for another location which is less attractive for them and make a combination of that. So we, uh, that, that is probably a solution for the, for the future to make these locational combinations and also invest in locations where they are less interested in and help us to uh, recreate and uh, uh, give the, the, the urban redevelopment in some locations an impulse. Um, and, and creating um, too many houses for only uh, small uh, households gives a, a disbalance in your neighborhoods, uh, we consider. So we don't, we don't uh, want to have too many locations in our uh, future um, uh, locations where we want to build to be too one-sided uh, on, uh, on the atmosphere of uh, small households. Because when you don't have families and don't have uh, children, there's also less attention for um, uh, uh, keep, keep, keeping the, the environment safe, etc. So, the, 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 yeah, we don't want to create one-sided neighborhoods. That's a problem. But there is a big attention to, to, uh, to invest, nevertheless. But we have to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to, to put our own organizational power on it to create good neighborhoods. That is, of course, also very much related to the question of segregation. For whom do we, we build our cities for? But you, you touched on a very important issue. Um, that's that's the, the land the land question, the question of land price. Uh, and I want to, to, to pass the word to you because uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by uh, by what you're doing or trying to do now on the metropolitan level in, in, in developing this, uh, this, this ambitious housing program uh, together with the private sector but on the basis of a metropolitan cooperation between the 36 municipalities of the metropolitan area. Um, can you give just a little bit more background on how this developed? Because I think metropolitan housing policies is, is a crucial issue for many cities in years to come. Yeah, um, I f first have to say that the uh, cooperation between the Metropolitan Authority and the city of Barcelona in terms of housing uh, hasn't been really uh, active in the past years. Uh, there were two administrations, not hostile, but they were not cooperating, that's all. Uh, the, but the reality, as, as Laia said in a previous uh, uh, comment, is that we are, we are uh, limited by two rivers, the, the, the mountains and, and the sea, and the real city is not Barcelona. The real city is the metropolis, is the places where you can go if you have uh, transportation means. So that implies these 30 something municipalities. Both teams, I believe, the uh, metropolitan and the municipal, we have agreed that the problem is metropolitan and the solution should be metropolitan. Uh, and without underlying too much the, f the future implications of this instrument, because in a way it's a seed of a future uh, metropolitan policy uh, in, in many respects, in terms of how do you uh, um, uh, survey the demand, how do you allocate the houses, how, and how do you match offer wind demand, uh, we, we are convinced that we have to work together. So what we have done is we have several plots of land that they will be used for this operation. Around 50% are municipal in Barcelona and the other 50% are in the other municipalities. Uh, we will provide f with money and we are looking for private equity. And then if, the, um, if this works, uh, the idea is that the instrument could be uh, bigger in the future, or we could have several instruments, as, as you have in other cities, because you have different entities. Uh, the I think the main problem of this type of operation, uh, of operations, is yes, the uh, metropolitan governance, which is complex, 36 municipalities with different political parties, different uh, uh, technical teams, is quite complex. Uh, it's undeniable. But at the same time, this public complexity has to talk with the markets. And they see us as one. They don't see 36 bodies, they see one. And they want us to talk in their language. So they always ask the same questions. Are we talking about real land or potential land? If it's real land, the land is developed and is ready to be uh, built on or still has some uh, town planning work to do. Uh, is the land uh, well distributed or is concentrated in some places? 
will, the, will be the future neighborhoods uh, low class, middle class, or middle up class? Where are they? How, how difficult are going to be uh, these, these uh, buildings to manage? Are we going to manage this stock professionally? Or we will have to be always uh, having to do a compromise between politics and, and, and corporate uh, money. Uh, what is your uh, aim in terms of profitability? Because what, would you, what, what you can do in a city is say, we need social housing, we need social, rental social housing. You have to help, help us to do it. And we want you to uh, retrieve from tourist market and to luxury market, and you have to concentrate in a very affordable housing, and we will change the rules to force you to do that. If you don't give the market uh, a, a B plan, an exit, a platform where they can derive uh, investment uh, to, for, for affordable housing, that will be a problem. So I think we have to talk their language. We have to give them securities, guarantees, and uh, certainties of what we are going to do to run a very professional rental company where 50% of the equity belongs to the public and 50% belongs to private companies. A long-term effort is not a problem just to make a few units for a few days. And uh, to develop something that you, gave it, you give it for granted because you have it, uh, that your financial providers are very capable of uh, helping us as well, but we have legal boundaries. Because, for example, your providers, by law, they have to work in Austria. Your providers, by law, I think they are not forced to do it, but the tradition is that they work within the system. So we need to develop a network around Europe uh, to, to, uh, to provoke that the money that is out there invests in the places where we haven't done these projects yet. And by the way, we are more in a way, we are more interested in that the consolidated systems, because in your case, the system already exists, is regulated, everything is certain, and you know uh, what is going to be the profitability and the difficulties. In our case, the system is to be, to be developed. So the players who come here at first place, they will shape the market, and they will shape the new sector. So we have an opportunity, but at the same time, we have the, this complexity of speaking their language, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, overcome the national uh, boundaries, which is not easy. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're really, really running out of time, but I would I'd like to have at least a second, a short, short uh, final comment from, from all the, the panelists is that uh, as this is a, 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 an event uh, organized by Eurocities, uh, I would like to, to know just in, in, in one or two sentences, what would be key for your housing policies, what is key that the European Union or on, the, or on a European level is to be done, that is to support uh, local housing policies? D'abord, je trouve que la, la discussion qu'on a depuis, euh, depuis ce matin montre que nous sommes confrontés à des problématiques qui finalement sont assez similaires. Et donc, euh, à bien des égards, l'intervention de l'Union européenne pourrait être utile à mes yeux sur deux aspects. Euh, D'abord sur la question du logement social. Où on ne peut pas dire que jusqu'à présent, euh, l'Union européenne ait considérablement aidé les États qui souhaitaient développer le logement social. Or, de mon point de vue, ça serait euh, extrêmement euh, utile euh, que cette aide euh, existe et qu'en tout cas l'Union européenne promeuve le logement social plutôt que... Euh, elle ne soit dans une logique qui vise euh, à, à, à le restreindre. Et deuxièmement, je pense que euh, l'Union européenne pourrait aussi nous être utile sur tout ce qui concerne la régulation euh, des plateformes dont on parlait euh, euh, tout à l'heure, parce que toutes nos grandes villes sont confrontées euh, à cet enjeu et qu'en euh, en lieu et place d'une logique dérégulatrice, on aurait au contraire besoin d'une logique de régulation qui fasse primer l'intérêt général sur les logiques de, de profit à court terme. Donc sur ces deux sujets, je pense qu'il y a matière à travailler. Very short because I finished my presentation just making an, an ask to the, to the European institutions. First of all, to put the, how, the right to housing in the center of the European agenda. It means funding and it means protection. So we need a regulation 
that made the right to the house and the social function of the um, of housing in the in the center and we need to protect so it with directives and it means to change the the rules while we are living in the after crisis of a severe economic breakdown not only in Europe I think it's actually time for affordable housing and I'm really appealing to all and especially to the European Union to set a positive framework and with a positive framework first of all I mean I want to have the chance for long-term investment which is housing, which is infrastructure, schools and kindergarten, and they don't want any restrictions because we have, as local authorities, we have to be able to act. And I want to be able to say it's my kind of subsidiarity. I know what we need. I don't want any restriction to the state aid law because it's the municipalities who have to be able to provide, and, uh, to provide social housing. In one sentence? One sentence. Uh, uh, legally speaking, uh, we need uh, the European Union to leave us alone. We, we don't need anything special. We want to be normal companies. The public companies, we want to be regular companies in the market and be treated like they are. We don't need anything specific. And financially, we need help. We need uh, tools in order to develop projects to make businesses and uh, to develop uh, public services as well. So if they leave us alone legally and they uh, give us some aid financially, uh, the markets will be uh, more stable, they will be more sanitized, and we will develop good businesses. Not, they won't be speculative, but at the same time those businesses will be uh, complementary to the uh, action of the, of the public services in terms of housing. So leave us alone and show us your money. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Europe can be helpful uh, to influence uh, the national governments um, to uh, put pressure, um, uh, the national governments not to be counterproductive to, towards the cities which are in problems. So, um, and we experience that in many countries that uh, the national governments don't understand the specific problems in cities which are under pressure. And uh, maybe the European um, organization can help to, uh, to, to, to get their influence towards uh, the national governments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we were a little bit longer as, as, as expected, but thank you very much for your comments, for your presentations, for your interest, and now the next session is already starting, so we have to leave the podium. Thank you.